This video discusses Kodak Ektar, a medium 100 speed C41 color negative film. We're going to look at how to use it, the film's characteristics, the technical details, and lots and lots of sample images. I get asked a lot whether or not I like Kodak Ektar, and I know there are reviews that are positive and there are some that are negative, but I'm gonna end your suspense right now. Ektar is my favorite film stock ever made, and that's gonna make the rest of this review fairly positive. Kodak Ektar is a 100 ISO film, like I said, but that's only true if you're shooting in daylight. If you're using Kodak Ektar indoors, then it's different. For instance, under 3400 Kelvin studio lamps, Ektar is 32 ISO. Under 3200 tungsten lamps, it's 25 ISO. So the warmer that the light is, the slower that the Ektar is going to need to be rated when used indoors. And we'll see why this is and understand it when we take a look later in the video at the spectral sensitivity curve. Currently, Kodak Ektar is available in four formats, though only three are widely available. 35mm, 120, and 4x5 can be had almost any place that sells Ektar. 8x10 is also available, but only from select outlets, and the only place I've found it to be available consistently is B&H. Ektar uses color technology that's from the Kodak Vision motion picture stocks. Vision is really Kodak's best film. It's used for movies, and they pull out all the stops to make it really fantastic. Ektar also uses a tabular, or what's called a T-grain, type of silver halide crystals. Now, the T doesn't mean that it's shaped like a T. T is just short for tabular, and tabular crystals are small crystals, and they're very flat and very thin, so the shape of the crystals optimizes the surface area and photon sensitivity within the film emulsion. The combination of Kodak Vision color technology and T-grain crystals means that the grain in Ektar is nearly imperceptible and that the stock is optimized for digitization. In terms of tonality and tonal range, it's exceptional. Kodak uses a special image enhancement chemistry on this film stock. Now the benefit to that chemistry, however, is improved color trueness and dynamic range. To my eye, the colors on Ektar are the most true of any film I've ever used, which is to say they're not pale, they're not oversaturated, they're not garish. They're very real to the way my eyes, at least, see colors in the real world. In terms of acutance, on Ektar it's exceptional. Kodak has some proprietary DIR couplers. I don't know what DIR stands for. But the, in this emulsion, according to Kodak, those couplers lead to fine detail with distinct edges. DIR couplers, in general, are a compound that's used in film emulsion that diffuses within the film emulsion during development. Their job is to inhibit development, which leads to more even exposure results and greater latitude. Now, I'm not entirely sure how the DIR couplers in Ektar improve detail and edge clarity, but according to Kodak, they do that, and they should also be responsible for Ektar having amazing latitude and very even exposure across the entire frame. In terms of contrast, it might seem that the DIR couplers would sap some of it and leave Ektar kind of flat, but that's not the case, and contrast is exceptional. Ektar has great contrast, yet it retains recoverable data in the shadows, especially, and in highlights to a degree. Having worked with Ektar scans, and noting that, that scans, the, the act of scanning reduces a lot of dynamic range and reduces a lot of shadow detail from the film, I've still been very impressed with how many shadows are recoverable in Ektar, even with the scans. Now what that means is if you're able to print color film in a dark room, or if you can digitize it with a DSLR and then process it in post to true up the colors, you're gonna have even greater latitude with controlling your shadow and highlight exposure in this film. In terms of sharpness, again, Ektar is exceptional. Ektar is the sharpest color film I've used, and part of that is because of the T grains, and part of that's because of the DIR couplers, and also part of that is because the emulsion is a cubic type for dynamic range, which is also called gamma. On Ektar, it's exceptional. As I noted earlier, the emulsion is a cubic type using the tabular T or T grain crystals, 
and the emulsion has DIR couplers in it. The crystals and the emulsion and the couplers, that team works well because silver halide crystals have limited light sensitivity. To enhance sensitivity, sensitizing dyes are added to the emulsion. That's commonplace with films. In Ektar, those dyes adsorb onto the film. Not absorb, but adsorb onto the film. These dyes are sensitized, which means they are receptive to light in a specific wavelength range. This is how different films have different sensitivities to light waves, the dyes in the film. This holds true for black and white, as well as color film, by the way. Anyway, the point of this is that to increase sensitivity, surface area, specifically of the silver crystals, needs to increase. The tabular grains increase that surface area in as much as it can be increased with modern technology, and the cubic arrangement in the emulsion increases surface area further. This increased surface area increases light sensitivity and color receptiveness based on the dyes that are on the crystal's surfaces. Most of the reviews that I read before completing this video called Ektar a warm film. I saw some that rightly acknowledged that it's a cool to neutral film. Uh, and it could also just be that the uh, search algorithm was giving me lots and lots of reviews that said it was a warm film. But as we'll see in the spectral sensitivity curves, that warm categorization is not actually true. I suspect that the reviews that state that this is a warm film do so because Ektar has a very high blue sensitivity and a broad neutral spectral table in the mid-range and very low red sensitivity. So in Photoshop, hitting Control shift b to auto-color the image will jack up the red tones because there are so few inherent to the image, and it needs to counterbalance, Photoshop needs to counterbalance the blues and the greens. That auto-toning gives the film an artificial red cast that it doesn't have when it's scanned neutrally. So reviews that call this a super warm film should be viewed through a lens of, hmm, Perhaps that reviewer didn't really use the film and the photo editing software exactly as they were designed to be used. Ektar has a number of good uses, in my opinion. I think it's amazing for portraits, and when it comes to portraits, this is one of those times where the, red, the low red sensitivity and auto-toning can really work well, because you'll get a neutral tone back, but you can, in, a, in, a different, in adjustment layers, increase the warmth, in, uh, do a partial opacity blend, make the images a little bit warmer, bring out some more flesh tones. Anyway, Ektar is an amazing tool for portraits and has a lot of flexibility to give you a lot of editing range. It's also amazing for landscapes and exterior architecture photos. Studio and product work under the right circumstances are great options for Ektar if you compensate for the reduced sensitivity under warm tone artificial light, and also pop a gentle color correcting filter onto the lens to counterbalance the light's color. Ektar is not an ideal Star Trails film, and it's a worse film for astrophotography because the film color shifts to the green and cyan range under ultra-long exposure conditions. Let me revisit portraits for a minute. Uh, there are people who will say portraits, but the pink cast. Ektar does make white folk look pink, as in it makes white folk look like they just stuck their faces in a snowdrift for 30 minutes. Yeah, it does. So this magenta shift is not some kind of intrinsic anti-white film racism, but a physical response in the film to pale skin and white tones. But it doesn't happen with white backgrounds like in a studio. I suspect that this magenta shift is happening because pale skin is still filled with capillaries, and pale-skinned people's skin won't absorb as much light as darker skin will. So what happens is that when a pale-skinned person's face or arms or whatever gets sunlight, the light enters the skin, and then all of the colors except for the reds are absorbed by the blood vessels, and then the light that leaves from the face, which has been reflected by those capillaries, reaches the film, and the film hones in on that, that pinkish red tone. Digital conversion on Ektar is, again, exceptional. Kodak designed this film to convert to digital very well. This was one of the guiding must-haves, in fact, when Kodak developed Ektar. 
we're going to look at the spectral sensitivity curve and understand what it's telling us. And what it tells us is that ektar is biased towards cool tones. Note in the curves how much greater the cool tone sensitivity is compared to the warm tones. What this curve tells us is the higher the point on the curve, then the more sensitive the film is to that color. Now also note that the cool tones, also note that ektar is more sensitive to cool tones than to greens and yellows. Human sight has a peak color sensitivity in the blue-green and also in the yellow-green range. The green plateau for ektar means that cool tones will prevail if scanned neutrally, and that most people will perceive the images from ektar as cool if we expose the film to match the way that we see the world. That high blue sensitivity also means that skies will look great and explains why shadows, which are actually dark blue and not black in real life, retain so much detail on ektar negatives. Now I noted earlier that ektar needs to be exposed at 32 ISO and 25 ISO, depending on light color temperature, for studio and tungsten lights. This spectral sensitivity curve explains why. Because the film is less sensitive to warmer tones, the film needs more of that warm tone artificial light to compensate for the reduced sensitivity and allow for a proper exposure. Now the numbers on the left represent negative density or negative thickness. Those are two words that mean the same thing and basically it's how dark your neg negative is. Optical density on this scale goes from 0 to 4.0. 0 is clear and 4.0 would be basically as dark as is usable. Ektar has an early inertia point, and that's the point at which exposure begins after the shutter action starts. It also has a short toe. What those two things mean together is that this film will start recording an image very shortly after the exposure begins, and it will reach a suitable density very quickly after the shutter opens. This also explains how Ektar can retain exceptional shadow details. We've talked about it being more blue sensitive, but also because the exposure starts quickly. What that means is if you underexpose part of the negative, which taking a picture with shadows effectively underexposes the shadow portion of the negative, Ektar will still get some detail in that underexposed part, that shadow part, very quickly, which further contributes to the shadows being recoverable. Ektar has a nice, gentle, straight line section, which indicates a nice tonal range and contrast profile. A flat line, for instance, would indicate a flat or completely contrastless flat gray negative. A steep line would indicate a snow and charcoal negative. Balancing the gamma for a gentler slope delivers a nice balance of contrast with detail retention. There, on this chart, is no maximum density point provided. In real-world practice, I found Ektar to have a significant amount of forgiveness for overexposure. Exposure errors up to around three additional stops of light result in high grain but recoverable images. Uh, I accidentally overexposed a couple of photos by six stops, and the image quality was awful, but the lab was able to scan the images and the images were recognizable as what I actually took photos of. Kodak doesn't provide reciprocity failure data, but to shutter speeds as slow as a full second, Ektar will need no compensation. Beyond one second, Kodak suggests testing Ektar under your specific conditions. One thing to note is that with very long exposures, there may be color shifts. In my experience, I did not find a need to compensate for reciprocity failure until about four seconds. Beyond that, I simply added a half stop for every additional stop beyond four seconds. For example, a metered eight second exposure, I would give 12 seconds. A metered 32 second exposure, I would give around 90 seconds. The added half stop per stop is cumulative. In practice, what this means is that you will need to bracket your images if you are shooting longer than a full second. A good idea will be to shoot at the rated exposure and then a set of three images, 0.5 stops, one full stop, and one and a half stops over until you get a sense of how Ektar performs with your gear and in your settings. Kodak does not provide exposure latitude data in their data sheet. I found that with te the testing I did, which was deliberate, was that up to three stops over the images had increased grain but were still recoverable which means you don't have to worry about your meter being completely perfect. You can 
use the Sunny 16 rule, you can guess at exposure settings, and as not long as you're not way, way off, over or under, you're probably gonna be okay. Shoot it at the box speed. Unlike other films, pushing and pulling Ektar is not gonna yield much in the way of exciting or beneficial results. The range on this film, as sold, is fantastic. You're not gonna improve on it. For filters, Ektar needs basically no filters. A CPL filter for skies or a color correcting film for some artificial lighting conditions can help, but don't use colored, infrared, or special filters. They're not gonna provide any benefit. And honestly, Ektar records such nice blue tones anyway that a CPL filter is likely to just make your skies look artificial and over Photoshopped. My favorite Ektar format is 120. It enlarges to a 16 inch by 20 inch print without issue. And I think it could enlarge to 24 by 36 with the right image, the right print viewing distance, and probably the, the right 120 format. 4x5 Ektar is amazing. It's an experience. If you shoot sheet film, Ektar is incredible in this format. And now, I shot a couple boxes of Ektar and sheet film. I completely lack the skill and the gear needed to truly maximize the Ektar large format experience. But what I was able to return with some flawed pre-World War II equipment was still very tantalizing and impressive. Ektar is absolutely my favorite color film. It's actually just my favorite film. I like it more than Velvia, though I recognize that Velvia has more color saturation. Ektar beats Velvia also on cost and exposure latitude. It's easier to use, it's cheaper to buy and develop, and it delivers images that, for all intents and purposes, rival Velvia for most every use. I've shot both films, Ektar and Velvia, side by side on a number of occasions. The shots from Ektar have come out every bit as well as the shots from Velvia for landscape and architecture. Where Ektar is weaker than Velvia is in portraiture and digitization. Digitizing Velvia is very easy with a DSLR and a raw file editor. Ektar is not for every situation, nor is it for every use. There are photographers out there who say that Ektar renders all other C41 films and actually all E6 films, maybe except Velvia, as obsolete for landscapes. I completely understand that stance, but I don't share it. I love my Sennheiser headphones. They're amazing, they're the best headphones I've ever owned, but they don't make my Sol Republic headphones obsolete. Ektar has a look. It has a good look, but it is only one look. Not all scenes call for nor benefit from the Ektar look. Ektar came about as Kodak's direct response to digital photography and a need to invent and market a film that looks like the best digital images, but that can be used in 120 and sheet film formats. Ektar could be considered a substitute for digital sensors for medium and large format users. And frankly, even on 35 millimeter, Ektar outperforms many, many digital cameras. If I was told I could only ever shoot photos on Ektar for the rest of my life, I think I would be okay with that. It's a great film, the results are consistent, they're predictable, and of very high quality. Those are the three greatest things that a film can do on the technical side. That means that Ektar can support whatever creative vision you have for it within the confines of its capabilities. So if a photo on Ektar turns out badly, basically there's no blaming the film, only the photographer.